All right, Graham, we are live. Appreciate you being on the community conversation, man. Thank you so much for having me, Mike. It's a great pleasure to be with you. Yes, sir. So Graham, if you've listened to any of the community conversations, I'd like to start things off with just giving a little background on yourself and uh, how you found prototype, how you got involved in the gym, uh, how you found CrossFit, all that sort of stuff. So I, I know the folks listening would love to hear. Cool. So uh, I guess it starts off with uh, high school. I, I thought I was kind of an athlete, but I went to a pretty small school. So everyone had to be an athlete. You had to play on some kind of sport. I think there were 44 kids in my class. So you know, they needed enough bodies just to fill out a team. So I was always uh, picked for something. Uh, I played hockey, uh, lacrosse, and football, um, but always weighed about 155 pounds. And those of you that know me, I wish I could be 155 pounds now. Could never put on any weight, uh, never did anything. And then uh, got into corporate America where I was sort of involved in opening up stores for uh, you know various retail chains, some of which are no longer with us. The last one was Target, which would be with us for a while. And unfortunately, that involved a lot of uh, travel, which the kids, if you talk to them, I thought they loved it moving every three years, but they hated it. They never got to be in a community long enough. Uh, but for me, it involved a lot of time on the road, a lot of meals, lack of exercise, things like that. So I ballooned up to like 250 pounds. So I was, I was big, um, not very healthy, and I started running which is kind of like, you know, we talk about often at the gym and things like that. I used to run one mile and uh, die, <laughs> uh, you know, and then it got up to two and then maybe three. And then over the years, it got more and more. So I was basically a runner. And then my daughters, Caitlin and uh, Brooke, who you guys know, joined the gym before me, kept telling me, you need to do something more. You need to do something more. And I was like, no, 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 I'm you know, losing weight. I'm feeling pretty good. I'm doing fine, but I had you know, no upper body strength uh, at all. So they signed me up for the, um, whatever it was, the three month package that you guys offer for Christmas. And I was dreading it because I did not want to do it. And I'm great with Christmas gifts and things like that. They'll tell you anyone they give me, I'm always like, I don't like this. <laughs> I don't think I want it. So that was the one I really hated because I was training for Boston that year. And it was the first year I was going to run Boston. And all I could tell them, I was like, I'm going to get hurt. You know, this doesn't make any sense. Why are you guys doing this to me? So I got in and uh, Ben was the trainer at the time, um, you know, took me through um, the beginning classes. And then, uh, you know, the great thing about you guys is, I mean, everyone knew that, you know, I wasn't in great shape, you know, upper body wise or lifting or any of that stuff. So I think I lifted the bar for the first, you know, two months. Uh, which was great. Uh, you know, they watched me every time. I can remember Brian, you know, sneaking up behind me going, that's enough. <laughs> You're good <laughs> with that last weight. Uh, but it's something that you guys always take care of and watch me uh, and then try to tailor the workouts too for what I was doing for uh, running and things like that. So uh, I feel like I've gotten in much better shape than just uh, being a runner. Uh, and believe it or not, I hate running. Uh, you know, everyone thinks I love it. Uh, and probably just like everyone too, I, I think I hate every workout right when I'm in the middle of it. And then when you're done, you're like, that was awesome. It felt really good. So uh, yeah, so my, you know, the, the one thing is, I think you bring it up often too, is a lot of people leave gyms, you know, they get started, they get into it a little bit, you do it for a couple of weeks, and then you're done. Um, the community has been so good. Uh, you know, and I know it's overused. We talk about, you know, prototype community and what a great group it is and things like that. But literally every single person is supportive of you. I know I'm the uh, cute old man in the group now. So it's kind of fun. You know, people see that I do, you know, the scaled stuff and things like that. But, uh, you know, every single person has, has pushed me and tried to make sure I do the best I can. Um, those of you that know the 7 a.m. class, and I think everyone in the 7 a.m. class has picked up on this. But Russ Schwartz always likes to uh, sort of pick on me and go like, come on, Graham, you can do it. So I think everyone's done that now from John to everyone in the class. Like, come on, Graham, you can do more than that. Because <laughs> uh, as John will tell you, I tend to be a little lazy if I can do it uh, the easy way. I'll do it the easy way. And then when he corrects me, I'll go, but that's hard. <laughs> He's like, yeah, well, that's what it's supposed to be, Graham. So it's, it's been a great journey. I mean, I feel much better about myself uh, 
you know, um, and the nutrition is another really, really big part of that. Um, you know, I've taken nutrition with John and recently with Sam and, you know, I think it's like anything with coaching, you know, I've taken coaching in my real estate career and things like that. I think we all know the things we're supposed to do. Uh, and we know, you know, if we did those things incorporated into our lifestyle, we'd be you know, more successful, more fit, whatever it is. But when you have a coach that kind of asks, you know, how'd you do last week, Grant? You know, what we talked about, where are you at with this? Where are you at with that? Um, it, it really, really helps. Uh, and then I'll give one plug. I meant to get, tell Sam about this and, and John too. I just signed up for something recently, which I think is really, really great, is a uh, community share at Southboro at the Chestnut Hill Farm. And they give you like a stack of vegetables, which you've never eaten before, half of them. And then you get to try to eat them and incorporate them in your diet. You've got one week to eat all this stuff. And it's all vegetables, which normally I would just like, ooh, I don't want those. I want like a nice steak. Uh, so it's it's been really, really good. And it's uh, exciting to see what they have each time. That's awesome. I love those community shares. You get veggies. They do that for like meat and stuff too yeah. with like different places and that sort of thing now that's awesome graham and i uh i love you that you were talking a little about training for boston and then transitioned and started doing some crossfit training did you feel that that helped with your training with boston and then why don't you talk a little bit about that experience because i know over the last couple of years well 2020 now 2021 boston has shifted to more of a virtual i know in 2020 it was more of a virtual event they had to move it uh, unfortunately but what was that experience like for you? Well, I, I think the biggest thing was, um, you know, it really wore on my body when I first did it the first few times. And I don't think you realize that, you know, it's like, yeah, you, know, you think it's all legs when you're running a marathon or something like that, but it's not. It's, uh, you know, you notice, gee, my back hurts. You know, why is my, you know, why are my arms tired? Things like that. It's a lot of core strength you know, to keep you up. And then it's leg strength too, you know, the stronger I made my legs and the more we did different things like that, uh, it really helped with my endurance and things uh, of that nature. Um, the other thing too, is it just, uh, you know, it makes you a little bit quicker, but uh, also it was a little less painful too for the marathons and things like that. So, you know, the, the big, big one too is uh, really lack of injuries. Uh, I've had some, you know, nagging injuries when I've done them, pull groins, things like that. But with CrossFit and then, you know, and, and that's the other thing too, like we talked about, the coaches are really mindful of that too. Um, they look and they say, you know, Graham, what are you doing for running? What do you got for a long run the next day? They kind of know that if Friday I'm there for a workout and I've got a long run Saturday, that it's going to be, you know, not as much pressure on me to really do all the, everything there, but just really get a good stretch and things like that. Um, that's probably been the biggest thing though, is not just the strength and things like that, but learning how to stretch. I mean, I think you've seen, and John likes to joke about it too. I mean, my squats before were like, uh, you know, I don't know, maybe got down close to my knees. <laughs> you know, it wasn't anywhere near below my knees. And now I can get down, you know, pretty much below the knees, which is pretty amazing because as we get older, uh, we're going to get less flexible and I should be way less flexible than I am now. And I think the strides I look at in the five years, um, you know, just feeling better doing different things like that. And, you know, daily life, you notice it too. So it's great. Flexibility, man, it's such an important component. And that's the thing is that, you know, you incorporate that into every single one of the workouts you do in the beginning and a little bit at the end, but you don't, you don't really think about the stretching that goes on when you're actually performing the movements and like focusing on doing those movements, like you're putting the work into the technique on a squat and you're literally improving your mobility just by working the technique of that, of that movement. And, you know, you're just a you know, perfect example of that, putting in the work and putting in the, uh, the dedication and being mindful of it and listening to your coaches. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I, I, everyone I think does. I don't think I listen very well, but I do show up well. <laughs> so I show up just about every day. So that's good. That helps. You, you mentioned community and how that's a big part. Um, you have any like stories or any like moments or things that stick out in the back of your head? I know getting coffee on Fridays after the 7 a.m. class is, a, is like a tradition that you, that you guys do. What are, uh, what are some other things? Or maybe if you want to talk a little bit about that, what are some things that stick out in your mind um, that kind of goes beyond the... Uh, maybe goes beyond just the, the working out component of things. 
Yeah, no, I, I think that's probably one of the the most fun things that we've done. And, you know, with 7 a.m. and, you know, getting people into that too, it's just uh, we have a little routine uh, that we started a while ago where all of us get together and we head down to Red Mar. And it's probably one of the nicest parts because you kind of, you know, recap a little bit from the workout, but you also hear about what's going on in people's lives, and things like that. Um, I know I, I do not miss a Friday workout just because I know it's going to be coffee afterwards. And it's kind of a nice start to the weekend. Uh, and then I've learned so much. And I think everyone's learned so much about me and uh, my grandchildren and things like that. What's important to me. Uh, and we have great discussions. I mean, discussions, we even discuss politics sometimes. So it's, uh, you know, it's interesting and fun. And uh, it's been great for us to, uh, to do that. Um, the other social things too, are just like, you know, some of the events we do too, are just so much fun because you get to meet so many people that, uh, you know, and that's when my kids kind of sold me on this was like, it's not just a workout. It's also getting to meet people. Um, you know, and you guys know I'm a member of a running club too, Hopkins and Running Club. And that's sort of the same thing we do. We have, uh, we run for whatever it is and then we all meet for coffee afterwards. And the coffee afterwards is probably, I don't know if I'd be a runner if I didn't, you know, do the coffee afterwards, just the relaxing time and meeting people and talking to them and finding out more about them. Well, you are a super social guy, man. And that, that brings me to the next thing I want to talk about is like, you've, you've transitioned, right? You mentioned that your prior like work life was in like corporate America, working on retail and, you know, opening uh, different companies. Uh, you said specifically the last one was, with Target, but you transitioned into the real estate world and you're one of the community business sponsors here at, at Prototype. Um, I know being social is a huge part of that because my, uh, my mother-in-law is probably listening to this right now because she's interested and would love to hear from you is um, you know, being social is a big part of like the real estate side of things. And we've been in a crazy market here over the last like year or two or plus with, um, with the housing market and everything. Um, I'm sure folks would love to hear from your perspective what that world has been like uh, for you, but also just like what you're what you've seen um, over the last like year plus, and maybe like what you're what you think is going to happen going forward. Cool. Well, this is this is kind of my uh, it, it's fun because this was supposed to be my retirement job, uh, and Joanna and I we moved we moved like every three years, so I think we bought and sold seven houses. So that's 14 houses. Then we bought other properties too. But every time we bought one, we were kind of like a HGTV. You know, we, we show up for a weekend, go for a tour, look at five houses and then end up buying one. So we were a realtor's dream. I mean, it was awesome. We just walk in, we wouldn't really, you know, make it too hard. We had to have something quick. We had to have a place for the kids and, and me to get started in my new job. So, and we always looked and said, you know, I never... I don't think there was one realtor we ever wanted to use again, you know, that we really were impressed with their service or their follow through or things like that. So I saw a big gap for that. I, I started in real estate is funny too, because I grew up in Greenwich, Connecticut and my mom was a realtor. And what I used to do in high school was uh, help her and some other realtors by like painting houses and fixing them up and getting them ready for sale. So I guess I was in real estate when I was like 17. I didn't really know it. Um, but I think that's the thing that was really lacking in the industry and, and probably still is. It's just, you know, personal contact, personal attention, um, things like that. My, my dad in Greenwich ran a small uh, agency, and I think that's my slogan, too, on the wall there is, you know, personal attention you deserve because he was Pettengill agency and personal attention. So I thought that was that was a great little thing for us. So. You know, it, it's something I started when I first started. I didn't know, you know, how I do. It's a, kind of an iffy business. You can do very well. You can, you can not. But I went into it like everything I do, a whole hog. Uh, learned as much as I could very quickly. Listened to people around me and uh, took the training very seriously to do that. And the first year I was rookie of the year, which was great. Uh, and then pretty much a top performer, top 10 right from year one. So the last few years, I've been the top uh, agent in my company, which is about 400 agents in the Massachusetts area. And last year, I was in the top 50 for national. So it, it's been good, um, but I'm not so happy with that. I like to you know, share that as I'm more happy with 
people who, you know, call me up and say, hey, Graham, you know, Mike Collette used you as a realtor and he wants you, you know, he said you were great. So I'd like to use you too. Um, those are those are the best clients to work for and the best things. So, uh, so I've enjoyed that. I think we do a good job, my team. I've got an admin, a couple of people that work for me, do marketing, things like that. So we try to do things a little differently. Um, you know, stay up to date with electronics, things like that, so that we're, you know, on the cutting edge of that. And it's funny because ERA is called the Electronic Real Estate Agency was their company name because they were the first ones that have a fax machine. So they were on the cutting edge of that. So when you look at, you know, what the market's been like, and it's really funny because, can I get into this like 12 years ago, I think? And within a couple of years, everyone was talking about lack of inventory, lack of inventory. So we've been saying that for, you know, the past 10 years, probably. So people probably think I'm making it up when they ask, you know, why is real estate so tough right now? It's because of lack of inventory. But this year, really, we saw, you know, probably the worst year ever for lack of inventory. Last year was unusual because there was some inventory. I don't think buyers were really as interested in buying as they were now. Um, so a couple things we're seeing, which is real interesting in the market right now, and we saw this last year, was it's people who lived in the cities and were thinking about a move. Like, and I'll use you and Aaron as an example. If you guys were living in Boston, you'd probably be loving it right now. Uh, but then you'd be thinking, you know, maybe in a couple of years, if we're thinking of family or you know, dog or pet or something like that, we'd love to be out there. So what the pandemic did was it kind of escalated that because people now are stuck in their apartments, you know, they're, you know, 800 square foot in Southie was awesome. But when all the restaurants were closed, it was, it was terrible. So it accelerated that move. The other thing that really accelerated is interest rates, interest rates being at, you know, 3%. I know some people, I, I say, you know, they may go up to 4% and people are like, oh my God, that would be terrible. Well, I remember, you know, Joanne and I buying a house once and it was like nine, five or something. We were thrilled because it was under 10%, you know, under double digits. So, you know, interest rates are driving it too. And then the other thing is just, you know, the, the extreme, extreme lack of housing because it's a double-edged sword when interest rates are that low and you can't find houses. People who own real estate are like, well, why would I sell my house that I bought for 30, 300,000? You know, even if I sell it for 600, I've got to buy a new one now that's more expensive. My interest rate is 3%, you know, so I'm paying like 1200 bucks a month for that, you know, rather than move up. So that's kind of the tough thing to get people to realize. I think COVID at first was a, a driver in that, you know, people were afraid to put their house on the market. People were afraid that we would, you know, be a chaotic open house with people walking in and touching everything and coughing all over their house. And, you know, we did a very good job, very responsible with it, you know, as realtors to make sure we got as many people in safely. Um, so, you know, those are some of the things that are driving it. We've seen, you know, anecdotally, you know, this year in January, February, March, we saw 3,000 homes on market in all of Massachusetts, single family homes. That's like nothing. I mean, and you can look at any community now. It used to be, you know, uh, say, you know, if you and Mike, we were going out to look at houses and we said, Graham, we want to look at the four to five hundreds in one town. There'd probably be 10 to 12 houses we can look at. We'd narrow it down to four and we'd go pick those best four. Now there's one. There's like 10 on for like, you know, Westboro, I think there's probably like 15, 16 homes on the market. And then every every weekend they uh, cycle out and they sell and then we get, you know, five or six more. Um, we've seen now an increase, but it's still only up to, I think this today, it was 4,500 homes on market in Massachusetts. So mm -hmm. those are incredibly low numbers. Um, I don't see them, you know, going up. I think this summer is going to be unusual though, because I think we're going to see a lot more people putting them on, uh, thinking about it. And then the buyers, you know, it's just so frustrating right now because I have, uh, you know, buyers who maybe go out for seven, eight weeks in a row, you know, putting offers in each time and not getting a house. Uh, you know, finally, when we do, we're, we hold on to it. People are being very aggressive to their offers, which is very difficult. Um, they're looking at waiving contingency. So no inspection, no appraisal, uh, which is very, very risky. 
I don't like to do that to my buyers because, uh, you know, if you lose your job or the inspection doesn't go well, you're stuck with buying that house. So you've got to be very careful with that. So those are a couple of the obstacles I see. But, you know, the, the big, big thing is, and this is what I talk to my clients too, is it's not, you're not buying a price point. You're not buying a $600,000 house or $700,000. you are buying a monthly payment. So in, with interest rates as low as they are, I mean, that's 600,000 of a nice down payment, maybe $3,000 a month. I mean, that's, you know, the Avalon's 2,800. I have two dogs. So it's even more than that if you have to do that sort of thing. So, you know, while the payments are good, that's what you want to keep looking at. Um, my wife was the master of that when we used to buy houses. Um, you know, we'd be looking at $600,000 house and she'd always go, well, for seven, it's only, you know, an extra 300 bucks a month we could get this house and all of a sudden we'd be up and, you know, we're way above that number. <laughs> it was just a little bit more, a little bit more. And he kept doing that, but it's a good value. And, uh, you know, it's a good opportunity as we all know. I know you're loving your house. So, uh, you know, it, it's a great thing to have. We got super lucky because it was right at the beginning of the pandemic. It was like March, April. And it was like, right before everything started to go up in price because like you talked about there's a few factors but it you know i think what you're saying it boils down to the supply and demand right and then it must be challenging too for a lot of buyers now like based on what you're saying you know a lot of full cash offers no contingencies but also the prices of the houses are a lot higher because of that supply and demand so when you have like clients that you know might be working in within a particular price range it's, from what i'm hearing you're saying is like they're almost getting it's, like, it's a, too competitive for them to even be able to purchase a house that they might have been able to get a year or two years ago yeah and the, and the key thing is that you have to remind people around remind myself too even because we're thinking of getting it like a place on cape or something is even though the price appears high now if interest rates do creep up next year even like a full point that's probably going to add, you know, eight hundred thousand dollars to your monthly payment. So, you know, the price of the home is still relatively cheap, even though it's gone up a hundred thousand or two hundred thousand, whatever they have. I mean, we've seen them fairly consistently going up five percent just about every year, the last few years, and we know that's not sustainable. But you know, Boston has been great. I mean, even in '08 when the market crashed. Um, some of the communities around here, the Westboro's, Hopkins, things like that, barely dipped. I mean, they were flat for a little bit, but, uh, you know, not, not a big dip. Some of the more outlying ones with more land and where there's more construction, those got hit a little bit harder, but they rebounded back quickly. I mean, we're such, in such a unique situation here that, you know, with between technology, pharma, things like that, we have so many high paying jobs that uh, people can afford that. And I, and I think back to your search, and I know a couple of my clients who have been successful, um, everyone wants move-in ready, okay? So those move-in ready houses with, you know, the granite, the nice appliances, and, you know, it, it looks and feels young. Those are the houses that go quickly. Um, one of my clients just got a great house in Hopkinton for a great value. It was definitely grandma's house. I mean, it was ugly carpet, um, you know, Formica counters, you know, some wallpaper, but all that stuff goes away quickly. You just got to get over that and look by and say, hey, these are things that'll add value quickly to this house and it'll do well. So, yeah, that, that's my tip for anyone out there now is, you know, avoid the shiny pennies, I like to say, because everyone's going to want those. Uh, you know, it's something that we could just do, you know, get a hardwood guy to come in or, you know, vendors like that and take care of it. That's great. Um, and that's the other really good thing about the community that we're in here. I mean, I've met so many and you've, you've done a great job too with, you know, connecting the vendors with each other. Um, you know, I called Jeff Foster up for anything, you know, real quick, he takes care of me. Um, then I've got uh, uh, Scott Dreyer uh, with insurance. Um, he's phenomenal with any problem you have, anything he has. I mean, he's got that same energy you see in the gym uh, out there with his business. So, uh, you know, they're, they're great people and you know, you can trust them, which is really good. Uh, so yeah, there's some fantastic folks. Scott is a good guy to golf with just like you are, which is, uh, I know <laughs> it's probably one of your, your favorite hobbies. I'm sure you're getting out on the, uh, 
on the on the course today. When did you start playing golf? By the way, when did you, that become uh, something you were talking about? You love, man. You you, uh, you why don't you tell people? Because I don't want to I don't want to spoil it. But you're out there like every day ripping around the course and trying to set the course record, land speed record. Yeah, I just set the speed record. I'm setting any other records. Uh, yeah, so go- golf is funny though because my parents were members of a great club in Greenwich. And I had the opportunity to take lessons and do all that stuff. And I absolutely hated it because as a kid, if you're not good at something, it's horrible, you know? So I think I took a lesson at 13, went and played with someone once. And I had like a 13 and a 14 on two holes. And I was like, I'm out of here. I don't, I don't want to do this anymore. Uh, so I gave up on it. And then the funny story is then when we were like 18, we used to sneak on a lot of courses. So we'd, we'd run around, play, you know, the back nine of a bunch of really nice courses down in Connecticut. It's funny because some of my friends are members of those courses now and they say, yeah, I had to join because I had to see what the front nine looked like. <laughs> I never saw that. <laughs> so I, I never played, you know, I played a little bit, you know, kept doing that. And then uh, yeah, it's just been, been really nice now to have the opportunity to play some cool courses and things like that. And some friends are have some good ones too. So yeah, golf is fun, but golf to me is, it's like CrossFit. I mean, CrossFit, I wake up in the morning and you don't always feel great. You know, in fact, many mornings I'm like, I don't think I can go do it. I'm a little stiff too much. But once you get into the gym, it's like everything goes away. You get into the stretch, you do this, everything's awesome. And the golf course is the same way because, you know, all of us have stressful jobs and things like that, things going on and you get out there, you know, it's just all of a sudden you're outside. It's beautiful. You know, I don't play well, but it doesn't matter. You know, it's still a pretty place and, uh, you know, lots of grass and uh, it's awesome. Yeah. I want to take one good shot to bring you back. <laughs> well, yeah, maybe one. The hard part is putting those good shots together. I've learned That's I've what... learned that for sure. That's the yeah. hard part. But um, so, all right. So golf has to be your one of your favorite hobbies because that's that's our, we're getting into our spitfire around the questions here, Graham. Um, is that, is that confirmed or what are, what are your other hobbies outside of, um, you know, working out, uh, maybe time you spend with your family? I know you're, uh, you know, you're a grandfather now. So, uh, what are your, your favorite hobbies and things to do? Yeah, I think, you know, golf is obviously awesome, but, uh, I love spending time with, uh, Cooper. Cooper's two years old and my, uh, little granddaughter, Blakey, who's seven months old. Uh, but Cooper's amazing because, uh, my kids like to laugh because I definitely probably have ADD or something like that, where I'm kind of all over the place all the time. And a two-year-old is the same way. So it's awesome. I mean, we can go look at, you know, a bird and then go see a cricket and then we'll go look at an ant and we go run around. We went to, uh, we took him, I took him swimming the other day and we got to go while we waited for the pool to open up. We got to go sit on a golf cart and then we got to go look for turkeys and then we got to go watch where they store the golf carts, which was the coolest thing in the world for him. And then we got to watch them clean the golf carts. So it was, you know, for me, that's perfect. We did 10 different things in five minutes. And, uh, you know, Brooke and Caitlin will tell you, that's kind of the way I, I schedule my day too, which is, they don't understand how I can do it. But it's like, you know, like today I've got, you know, I had a call at like the gym first and then a call at 8.30 then this one at 10 then another call and then I'm going to try to play golf later. So, you know, and I squeeze everything in. So I've got like 15 minutes between each one because that's a waste of time. Otherwise I got nothing to do in the middle of those. I can, I can relate to you on that stuff for sure. Um, next question, Graham, in the Spitfire round is what's your favorite movie and TV show of all time. And also to add to that, what are you currently binge watching if you're binge watching anything right now all right so the movies are are hard to get because everybody's got a bunch of movies they love my wife laughs at me all the time too because she's like you've seen that movie seven times i mean like a denzel washington movie i could watch again and again i mean man on fire things like that but apocalypse now is probably one of my favorite movies uh just because it's got a uh, uh, charlie sheen in it and uh what's in it, Robert Duvall, and just some of the lines in it are just phenomenal. You know, the smell of napalm in the morning. And then it has The Doors for a soundtrack and Rolling Stones. I mean, you can't beat it. So that one's pretty cool. It's a little hard to watch though, because it's 79 (laughs) is when it came out. So it's a little older cinematography. 
Uh, I'm going to go old again, too, on famous or favorite TV show. We used to love to watch 24. Uh, we thought mm -hmm. that was just the coolest thing because every every day and we learned some important life lessons from that. You know, I always told my daughter that, yeah, I would sacrifice her for the terrorists because I know we're going to die anyway. So <laughs> it's like <laughs> right? so when they say that when they say they're going to kill your, your daughter, it's like, you know, they're going to kill them. So you might as well jump now, and, you know, take care of it, take action quickly because <laughs> they always lie. It's reassuring. Uh, yeah, and then stuff we've binged. We don't really watch binge watch a lot, but we did get, and it's funny too, because at the gym and a coffee, we talk about, you know, what are you watching? What are you doing on TV? Things like that. And Shit's Creek came up and that's just a really funny, funny uh, show. And then we just started The Crown, which is kind of uh, interesting, but we got to get into that one a little bit more. Cool. I like how you referenced The Doors and The Rolling Stones, because that brings me to my next question, which I think I know the answer. <laughs> Yeah, you do. <laughs> what is your uh, favorite band or musician of all time? Yeah, favorite favorite band is definitely the Grateful Dead. Uh, I have that playing all the time. It's my uh, you know thing. There's there a lot of artists though I like too, which are which are cool. So we'll get back to that. But the Dead are fun just because I used to follow them as a kid, uh, and I di I didn't follow like I mean like you know seven states in like nine days. I think the most we did was like. Uh, Vermont to Portland, Maine. I think that was about it. Uh, and then a couple others. I mean, and then we went to Portland, Maine. You know, one of my buddies was like, oh, they're playing in Wisconsin in two days. We should go there next. I'm like, you're out of your mind. <laughs> Driving seven <laughs> hours to go do that. But we saw some great shows. Uh, a good friend of mine is friends with uh, a lot of the guys on, who play in the dead too. So we got to actually meet uh, some of the guys backstage too, and things like that. So that, that's awesome to know that. But yeah, they've been fun. And I think now it's pretty incredible to watch them because with John Mayer, it's like an entirely different feel to the music. It's still the same music, but it's got a really good bluesy feel to it. It's, uh, you know, and it's bringing in a lot of young people to hopefully keep the band going. So see what the next iteration of the Grateful Dead will be, but I think it'll be awesome. And that's my, my deal too. Can't wait to, uh, either run a marathon with Cooper and maybe take him to a dead show. So that's a ways off. We'll see if we make it there. <laughs> that's awesome. Two, two things on that is one is I know you're going to love, so you loving the endurance sort of stuff. And then also music, our rope or crows event is happening again this year, September 18th, uh, Chadwick Stokes and the Pintos are playing. We'll have three additional bands, food trucks, uh, beer, all that fun stuff. It'll be a fitness and, fitness and uh and music festival come together so you got you better make sure you make a team team of four rowing uh 21,000 meters 21 and 21 is the is the theme so it's like a half marathon row and a team of four so it's uh it's going to be a lot of fun and i'm sure that you'll if you can make it i think you'd uh you know get that team of four together maybe caitlin and john and brooke can be on a team with you or something i think they would dig it it'll be a fun time it'll be family and family and uh kids and family friendly as well yeah, I wouldn't miss it. It's fun to sponsor that event. That's a really nice charity too. They have put together for it. Yeah, it's awesome. Calling All Crows is awesome. And then the, the second thing I wanted to ask you is what's your favorite dead song? Oh, Can you nail one down? Huh. I don't know. <laughs> I, I guess it's, I guess Friend of the Devil probably is one of my favorites just because I got to see them play acoustic. But, uh, you know, also like Bertha, just because of the drums and things like that, you know. And, but uh, I guess, what's the other one? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I guess, I guess Friend of the Devil is probably one of my favorites. Yeah. You, can't, you can't go wrong with that one. Yeah. yeah especially when you hear uh, some of the new singers sing it too. Like Bob Weir's done it with, uh, I forget her name, a couple of just incredible new women singers who are out there now. And it's phenomenal. Awesome, man. Well, uh, Graham, love ending the community conversation talking about a little Grateful Dead. I know my uh, my father-in-law will appreciate appreciate that when he's listening to this. Uh, appreciate you being on Community Conversation today. Appreciate all you that are listening, tuning in. Again, we do a new Community Conversation every single week to get your week started. So tune in. Uh, we are broadcasting on Spotify, also on YouTube, and on our website. Uh, if you'd like to be on the Community Conversation, you're a part of the prototype community to let us know we'd love to have you on and again graham thank you for being on we appreciate having you man thank you mike have a great day you too